the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. My brothers, my sisters, I welcome you again for worship on the Lord's Day, this fifth Sunday of Lent. We come here again, always on worship, at worship, to get our minds off of ourselves and on the one who is himself truth and light and life. Let's prepare ourselves more fruitfully to celebrate these saving mysteries by calling to mind our sinfulness. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God, May Almighty God have mercy on us all. Forgive us our sin and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. By your help, we beseech you, Lord our God, May we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your Son handed himself over to death through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. As I've mentioned the last weeks, uh, Lent has its origins in that period of final preparation for those adults preparing for baptism. And we have, we have our catechumens with us again uh, today, and they will again be prayed over in the third scrutiny. But the scriptures are chosen particularly with them in mind, and the rest of us get to over here and remember, uh, remember how these words are addressed to us as well. The last two Sundays, we've read long, dramatic texts from the Gospel of John. Remember the woman at the well and how she grows? The man born blind, how he grows? Uh, today we face the, the greatest mystery of all, death, with the dramatic story, again from John, of the raising of Lazarus. First, we're going to hear from the prophet Ezekiel, an Old Testament, a rare Old Testament passage that speaks about God as one who is stronger than death and has a vision for us that's stronger than death. And then in our reading from Paul, similarly, confidence in this new life. Listen, Ezekiel, Paul, our gospel from John. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord, O my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them and bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and have you rise from them, O my people. I will put my spirit in you that you may live and I will settle you upon your land Thus you shall know that I am the Lord. I have promised, and I will do it, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit, if only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead, because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then you who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit dwelling in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. So the sisters of Lazarus sent word to Jesus, saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. 
Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said, Yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, his face wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary had seen what he had done and began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My father died after a long fight with emphysema, just weeks before I was to leave for study abroad for a year in seminary. Being the oldest at home that summer, it fell to me to help my mom make arrangements with the funeral home and church, visits to the lawyer and the social security office, and still make my flight to Israel at the end of August. But my third weekend there, for no conscious reason, I begged out of what was already becoming my classmates and my usual Saturday night trip into the city center to imbibe a little of Jerusalem's post-Sabbath nightlife. So my classmates took off, I stayed home, not sure why. The building was exceedingly quiet. And I reached for that blank book a friend of mine had given me to use as a journal. I had never used it yet, but maybe this was the time. 
So I wrote inside the cover, first page, the date, Saturday, September 14, the top of the page. And just as I did that, it dawned on me, it had been exactly a month, exactly a month since my father died on August 14th. And I wrote, Dear Dad, as if to begin a letter, I really hadn't had much time to think about him and his absence in my life. And as I began to write this letter, this imaginary letter to my father, a rush of emotion swept over me. And I cried and I cried. But nobody was there, so it was okay. Speaking of it later to our faculty chaperone who was with us in Israel, he responded, you know, with death, you'll have lots of moments like that. Indeed, as almost all of you already know, grief is a wild ride. Clinicians, psychologists may map its faces and predict its stages, but those are folks who aren't for the moment in grief themselves, and so they have the luxury of objectivity. But when the death of a loved one seizes you, you are in occupied territory and resistance is futile. That's why I so like this picture of an emotionally troubled, weeping Jesus being swept toward the tomb of his friend by Martha and Mary. If Jesus hadn't loved Lazarus and his sisters, he might at best have been philosophically interested about the topic of death. But it is love for Lazarus that's causing him grief, just as it is Martha and Mary's love that is causing them theirs. We're all eager to love and to be loved, but something we're not thinking at the time is that in giving our heart to someone, give your heart even to a pet, and there will be tears. Our first kiss and our first tear are linked together. This is our third great Lenten helping from John's Gospel in a row. The stories of these three exemplary characters are a map to a grown-up life with God. First for our catechumens, but for, for all of us. The woman at the well illustrated a first coming to faith, remember? With a chip on her shoulder and an ugly past, she was initially attracted by the practical payoff the stranger seemed to offer but eventually found in Jesus an acceptance independent of performance. And in that, she found living water to quench her most profound thirst. Last week, the man born blind took our hand and drew us further on the road of discipleship. When we begin taking God seriously, we might anticipate that everything will start coming up roses for us. But faith is a muscle, and muscles only develop in the face of resistance. So last week we saw the blind man grow as he faced unfriendly questions from the crowd and the Pharisees. He could have dodged the issue like his parents did, but he would not ignore that it is better to see than not to see. And that meeting with Jesus had opened his eyes. Without questions, without stretching, without discipline, life with God stagnates. But after the blessing of first faith, again, consider the woman at the well, and the deepening that comes only through resistance and having to explain ourselves, our faith to others, think the man born blind. Belief faces its biggest challenge in death. 
That's the moment we realize everything, everything depends on God. No human support, no achievement, no insurance policy goes with us to the grave. We, each of us, have to enter it, have to face it alone. If there is no God, when death comes, then there is nothing, nothing. St. Paul writes the Corinthians and says, is, if we have lived for this life only, then we are the most pitiable of people. The Lazarus story would speak of the richness that only comes to us by facing the ultimate question about the meaning of our life and the facing of death. Our first kiss and our first tear are bound together. The very love that causes our grief at loss is the same love that can console us. But we must trust the love and we must follow it to its root. We mustn't see our grief when we lose someone as a futile rebellion against our mortality. We must see it as a hint that there is more. There is more in store for us. The love that makes us accompany the ill and, and, and when those who people have died to visit their graves is showing us something of the nature of God's love. Where does our reluctance to let go of those we care about come from if not from the one whom we call love itself? The love that disturbs Jesus and makes him weep at losing Lazarus is the love that makes him go after his friend and free him from death's grip. God's love in Jesus will not let Lazarus go. So death has to surrender, has to release him. The Christian idea of the resurrection of the body isn't based on some innate quality of the human spirit, some eternal flame, some candle in the wind that just goes on and on and on. No, it's rooted in the experience of God's unspeakable love for us. So while Martha talks about resurrection for her brother someday, someday at the, after the end of time, Jesus speaks in the present tense, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who hook up with me will never die, no matter what, because I am hooked up with the very source of life, my Father. So our creeds and hymns in church never talk about life after death. I've read them all many times. You'll never find that phrase, life after death, in the scriptures, in the missal, in the prayers of our tradition. Instead, what you'll find over and over again is the phrase or the term eternal life. Not life that begins someday, but life that's meant to begin now. Not a perhaps that we might wake to eventually, but something that we know, something that we foster, something that drives us and heals us and prods us even now. Eternal life, beginning now and just continuing to expand. So the love that causes our grief is at root the love that will console our grief. When Paul wrote the Thessalonians and said, do not grieve as those who have no hope, I take him to mean we Christians grieve as those who have hope. And I find hope, we should find hope in the weeping Jesus in the gospel who cries out, in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I would call forward our elect, preparing for baptism, and their sponsors. 
Elect of God, bow your heads and pray. Friends, let us pray for these chosen whom God will make his at baptism. May the grace of the sacraments conform them to Christ in his passion and resurrection and enable them to triumph over the bitter faith of death. against worldly deceits of every kind. We pray. That these elect may be given the faith to acknowledge Christ as the resurrection and the life, we pray. That they may be freed from sin and grow in the holiness that leads to eternal life. We pray. That the Eucharistic food which they are soon to receive may make them one with Christ, who is himself the source of life and of resurrection. We pray. and chronic illness and for those who live with depression anxiety and addiction we pray as we face together the challenges of the next weeks and months, we pray. You give life to our souls, calm our unreasonable fear, and keep us steady in times of panic. We pray. Father, source of life, in giving life to the living, you seek out the image of your glory, and in raising the dead, you reveal your unbounded power. Rescue these elect from the tyranny of death, for they long for new life through baptism. Free them from slavery, the slavery of Satan, the source of sin and death, who seeks to corrupt the world you created and saw to be good. Place them under the sign of your beloved Son, that they may share in the power of his resurrection and give witness to your glory above all.
Lord Jesus Christ, you commanded Lazarus to step forth alive from his tomb and by your own resurrection freed all people from death. We pray for these, your servants, who eagerly approach the waters of new birth and hunger for the banquet of life. Do not let the power of death hold them back, for by their faith they will share in the triumph of your resurrection. For you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Although you too cannot yet participate fully in the Lord's Eucharist, stay with us as a sign of our hope that one day all God's children will eat and drink with the Lord and work with his spirit to recreate the face of the earth. Brothers, pray, sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify them by the working of this sacrifice. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just.
indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this all of you, drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, William, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayer of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom there we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and
at the Savior's command, formed by divine teaching, we dare say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sin but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ in whose body and blood we have communion, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Again, I thank you for joining us for worship. The parish bulletin, uh, which also includes the music and scriptures for this day, can be found on the parish, the Eastside Parish's website. Please be free, free about telling others about that. Um, the governor continues to ask us to be very mindful of staying at home. But if you're out of the house for another chore and want to stop by, the churches are available for you for some quiet prayer. And there are tables at the back of each church with, again, bulletins and various devotional items. As we continue to pray our way, this most extraordinary, this most extraordinary Lent. Bless, O Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy. And grant that what at your prompting they desire, they may receive by your generous gift. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Amen.